Today on the Conscious Commerce Podcast, we have Amira Jiwa. She's a social impact and sustainability strategist. Welcome. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. No, you're so welcome to be here. And to get the ball rolling, um, we try to get to know you a little bit better first. And the question I usually ask is, what's a fun fact about you that not many people know? And the thing is, I've already discovered a treasure trove of fun facts about you from your website. So one that I definitely want to bring up is that you have a tradition of celebrating your birthday by eating the age you're turning in ice cream. Are you yeah. still doing this tradition to this day? I am. Um, yeah, I know. It's kind of ridiculous. I started when I was eight eight years old and then just kept going. And then it, every year I'm like, well, should I just do it this year? And it feels like I can't just stop. So yes, I'm still doing it. My birthday is actually coming up next month. So I'm going to be eating 28 ice creams, hopefully. <laughs> 28 is impressive. That's like I'm, a full I, shift. I know. I'm going to try and do it forever. I'm just going to slowly like shrink the size of the ice cream. <laughs> I'm not going to cut the number down. So like when I'm 90, hopefully, um, if I make it there, I'm going to have like 90 tiny ice creams. Yeah, hopefully they've invented really nutritious ice creams by that point. They can just be your meals throughout. The I know. Day. I try not to think about that too much. My sister's, my sister's a doctor. And like, as my birthday comes up, as I start preparing for this, she's like, this is terrible. You like, can't do this to yourself. And I'm like, well, it's just one day a year. Surely it's fine. I don't know. I try not to think about that side of it too much. <laughs> Yeah, one out of 365 days is fine to treat yourself, yeah. I reckon. Yeah. Um, it's it's a little indulgent, just a little. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> and I also read that you traveled to and lived in 26 cities in 2019. So what was your favorite city? And have you been keeping up your travel plans or has COVID put a bit of a stop to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think tw 2019 was a big year because I was living in New York um, and then moved to Mumbai and moved to London and then moved to Addis Ababa. So it was it was like one of my most international years so far that I've always traveled a bit. Um, I don't know that I could pick. I don't know that I could pick a favorite city. I know that's a bit of a cop out, but I think for me it was just it was like those four cities in particular. And then obviously I visited um, lots of different cities kind of through the process of my work. But like those cities that I was actually based and lived in. I think it was like the combination of the four of them, like the differences between them, the fact that I got to experience all, all of them in one year was really exciting. Um, and then 2020, I spent pretty much um, all, not just in London, but in, in one room in London. I think maybe <laughs> spent a couple of days outside of that room <laughs> thanks to COVID. So it was, um, it was a pretty different year. <laughs> and then now 2021. Um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people are... in the UK have that experience. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then now this year 2021 um I'm in Amsterdam at the moment because my husband lives here and so I'll be back and forth between Amsterdam and London but I don't expect that I'll be traveling um much beyond that for now <laughs> yeah uh because no issues community is spread out across the globe so we like to get a sense of where everyone's currently residing so what's great about Amsterdam for people Ooh. that haven't been there I have lots, lots of things. I, I like, because I'm coming from London, it's a really great city with a ton of culture and kind of everything that you'd expect for like a big international city, but it just feels like a tiny community, more like a neighborhood. So um, I'm just enjoying that, you know, I kind of am actually getting to know the person that sells me my coffee and my pizza or my ice cream, um, rather than just, you know, being a little bit of, of an anonymous kind of one in millions in, in London. So I guess, yeah, it's it's got that the combination of a big city and, and small neighborhood feel. Mm, that's really nice. And if you weren't a social impact and sustainability strategist, what industry or job do you think you'd be working in? Ooh, that's, that's an interesting one. I feel like I could be doing, honestly, so many different things. I, I, the, 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 the kind of career that I wish I wish I, I had sometimes, but I don't, I don't like, I'm not, I've never actually done anything towards it. I just love like the hospitality space, like owning a cafe or um, a restaurant or even a small boutique hotel. Like, I think that would just be fantastic, but obviously, you know, still, still maintaining sustainable principles in, in mind, but um, <laughs> something to do with, yeah, like that space and experience sector would, would be, would be really dreamy. Um, maybe there's, there's time yet. We'll see. What about an ice cream chef? I love, I, you know, I like the eating more than the cooking. Like I just love food so much and I'm a terrible cook. 
So I would like to be an ice cream chef if my ice cream was really good and if I could continue to enjoy <laughs> it all the time. But sometimes I think like seeing how things are made takes the magic out of them and makes you enjoy them less. So... Very true, actually. Very true. <laughs> I would Stay want to consuming ruin... ice cream rather I, than yeah, creating it. I wouldn't want to ruin the ice cream for me. If, if I saw how much sugar <laughs> went in, for example, like would I be able to consume 28 or 29 on my birthday? Maybe not. So... <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, especially with your tradition, like you can't see what goes on behind the scenes. (laughs) And I want to um, take us back in time for a second as well. So the year is 2000. Big Brother has just, just debuted on television. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire book has just been released. Y2K as a theory has just been debunked as well. Sustainability wasn't a concept on many people's radars back then. So do you think your job would have existed 20 years ago? You know, I don't, I don't think my job in this exact form would have necessarily existed, but similar work, whether it was called co- corporate social responsibility or kind of corporate partnerships or just kind of businesses making some kind of impact in the world, I think has always been around. Um, the, the kind of framing for it has just evolved over time. So this, this specific role that I do and maybe the variety of industries that I get to work with and the fact that I get to work with a lot of independent brands and small businesses, maybe, maybe that wouldn't have existed. But I do think even though you know, sustainability, the term might not have been a buzzword back then, uh, the concept of, of kind of thinking about the impact that you're making in a world uh, is, is not really a new one. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, going forward from that, Uh, The progression of social impact and sustainability in the business world, we've had movements of corporate social responsibility and social enterprises. So what kind of stage are we at now? Like what's the next wave? The way, so the way that I like to think about it, these are just kind of, you know, there's probably loads of different frameworks and terms that people have come up with. But the way that I like to think about it is that kind of, you know, two decades ago, even a decade ago, we really had, well, probably two decades ago, we had impact as an add-on. So that's when you saw a lot of philanthropic work, a lot of corporate social responsibility. You know, big businesses did try to make an impact in some way, but it was very separate from, from their regular business activities. And it was usually kind of just like siloed to a different team. So that was kind of impact as an add-on. Then um, we started having kind of like aligned impact. So that's what businesses thought, you know, we want to make an impact in the world and it should connect somewhat to, to, to our business model. Um, but it was still a little bit separate. So you had a lot of, you know, the buy one, give one programs where people would kind of have their business, maybe they sold glasses or shoes and then they, you know, donate a pair. So, so there was, it was still a little bit separate from, from being truly integrated into the business. But then, um, yeah, it, 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 it was a little bit more aligned with what they do. Then we had integrated impact. And I think that's really where we are today. Um, a lot of businesses are thinking we actually need our business model. The thing that we do has to have an impact associated with it. So our product needs to be slightly better or, you know, our, like the way that we deliver our product or the way that we sell it. That let's let's make sure that those things that are really core to our businesses is, is is integrated um, and makes an impact. So I think you know no issues probably falls right into into that category. Like with the products that you're selling, like you are selling sustainability or an, an option, an ability to be more sustainable to kind of all the businesses that you supply to. Um, and I think you know this is a, a pretty good place to be. Like it's exciting that impact is integrated more into businesses. But I think where we're heading next is more, um, or hopefully where we'll head next is more of an idea of really holistic impact. So you're thinking even beyond um, the one specific way that your business does good to to just being a great place to work, making sure that you kind of have all your ducks in a row and you've laid a strong foundation for impact across the board. So you're not just thinking about like, is my product made of recycled materials or do I have like a circular business model? But have I considered like diversity, equity and inclusion is, is, um, is, is the place that I work like great? Like, do my employees want to work here? Do we have great retention? Are we investing in our local communities? Um, are we making our consumers' lives better? Just thinking kind of beyond um, that single single point of, of impact that maybe businesses have integrated into their, into their models at the moment. Yeah, that's really exciting. And I just wanted to backtrack as well because there is a bit of confusion around the language used to describe a brand's impact. So it'd be great to hear your perspective breaking down in simple terms what looking at social impact and sustainability actually means in a business. Yeah, you know, I think it's tricky these days. I call myself a social impact and sustainability strategist. So people 
uh, know what I do, but but really like the term that I, I like to think about is, is just impact strategist because it's it's just about thinking like what is the impact that your business has on the world that might be good hopefully it's good it might be neutral maybe it's bad so it's it's just like what is the the broader impact of your business um the words sustainable ethical conscious these are all great words and they you know, they sound like they mean something, but to be honest, they don't anymore because they're super broad. Like, what does conscious mean? You just, you know, you think about things and you're a little bit more intentional. That's great, but you could also be intentional in, in a bad way, to be honest. Um, the idea of calling a business truly sustainable uh, is, I think, really tricky. Uh, it's always been tricky because, you know, very few businesses are actually inherently sustainable. Like most of them do consume more than they give back um, and their, their take is more than givers. And that's not like a bad thing because businesses maybe aren't meant to be totally sustainable in, in, in the true meaning of that word. Uh, so so when, I, when I think about brands um, and how they should talk about their impact these days, I think specificity is key. Like, just think, like, what is the impact that we're making in the world? And describe that. Like, is it through your materials? Is it through living wages? Is it through, like, the benefits and, like, the flexibility and the inclusivity that you offer your team? Don't use these big umbrella terms that could be defined so many different ways and just explain what you're doing that is slightly better than what you think is normal. And like, that's how we should be talking about sustainability and social impact. Yeah, because a mic drop moment I've seen you talk about is how there's no such thing as a sustainable business, which I think is like, would be a really new idea to a lot of people <laughs> aspiring to be one. Um, and you've also talked about how sustainability is more of a lens to overlay across your processes rather than an end goal. So can you expand on that a little bit by what you mean? Yeah, I think the simple thing is like, you know, sustainability is something that you do. It's it's not something that you are. So I think people like to think about, you know, they have a model for like what they think is a perfect brand or a sustainable business. And they just think, OK, let me just check off these few activities um, and then I'll be a sustainable brand, too. And and now, like I'd say probably like 70 percent of the new brands that I encounter uh, are calling themselves either ethical or sustainable. Uh, and they might have a few things to back that up. But again, the term is meaningless, I think. It's, it's really about saying like, look, I'm committed as a business owner or, you know, as, as someone who works for a business in whatever my role is, is to doing things slightly better and to reducing our negative impacts, increasing our positive impacts day on day. Like I do sustainability. I'm like constantly thinking about it. There's always room for improvement and there isn't some end goal pinnacle because I think the most sustainable businesses, um, the most, not the, yeah, the sustainable, the businesses that are doing kind of sustainability right they do view it as a journey and something where the goalposts are constantly moving. Um, and that can feel really intimidating, but it's actually really exciting to know that, you know, you're only really competing against yourself when it comes to, to impact. Like, can you, can you do better than what you were doing the year before or the week before or the day before versus like, here's this end goal. We check all of these boxes and then we've crossed a bar that means we're a sustainable business versus one that isn't. Yeah, do you think with getting around that kind of broad use of language a lot of people are throwing around, it's good to actually go to the legitimate certifications rather than saying I'm ethical, I'm sustainable and not really backing it up? Yeah, you know, I think certifications definitely have an important role. Um, I think that they can help businesses that maybe don't know what to, where to start or, or what what to do to kind of guide that process. And, and they do add, you know, a seal of approval. I think one that's um, really popular or becoming increasingly popular uh, amongst lots of independent brands, the B Corp certification, which is kind of like an all round certification. But I, I don't think that you need to be certified to be a, a business that is trying to do better and that is doing better. It's about being um, really careful and, and looking at all of your impacts and looking to reduce them over time. Certification can be an expensive process, especially for small businesses. It might not like the, the actual requirements for any given certification might not align and be the most relevant to, to what you do. So as an important role, I think it's, it's, it's great to see, to use certification processes as a tool to know how to do better and to know where to, um, where to focus your efforts. Um, but they're not the be all end all. Um, ultimately, you know, ultimately like a business can communicate the impacts that it's making that are positive uh, with or without certification. And if they're transparent and candid and know what they're talking about, like that will come through. 
Yeah, that's really good to know because, yes, yeah, certifications are out of reach for quite a lot of small businesses as well due to the time and money aspect. So, yeah, it can yeah. be a lot of time. It can be a lot of time. And it can be really bureaucratic. So I, I'd say, like, if you're if you're thinking about a certification, just look to see what the requirements are and use them as a guide. And, you know, there's, um, you know, I've worked with organic is an interesting one. That's, you know, you're certifying products rather than necessarily businesses. But uh there's a lot of growers and, and farmers out there who say like we use organic practices, but we can't, you know, like go through the burden of certification. So I think I think that's a real issue and um, try and focus more on the impact and less on the certification if, if that's all that, that's possible for you. Yeah, something we see quite often at No Issue is this hesitancy from people to start on like a deeper sustainability journey beyond packaging because there's that pressure they feel to do it perfectly. So what would be your advice to them on where to start or how to make it measure their progress in other areas? Yeah, I think <laughs> there's no such thing as perfect when it comes to sustainability, right? Like I think even, you know, take a brand that everyone looks at as like a pinnacle for responsible business, like Patagonia, even they will admit that they are not doing everything right. There is always room for improvement. And so that's exactly the reason that you should feel comfortable with like all of the gaps that might be um you know, that, that, that you might have to, to kind of improve on and work on. So I, I'd say, you know, there's this tendency and I've seen it a lot uh, with, with a lot of my clients who are doing, you know, making great steps, doing some interesting things, but they want to have everything in place before they announce it. And I understand like why they, they do that because there is a lot of fear, you know, of getting called out for not having done everything, for not doing everything right. Um, but the fact is, is that there are very few, if any, brands that are doing everything right. Any brand that is pretending that they've done everything right um, is probably greenwashing. And I think it's really helpful to actually say, this is how far we've gotten and this is where we know we've got to go and being transparent about that. Um, there is a role, you know, for consumers are getting more and more informed every day. And I think there was a lot of excitement around um, ethical you know, ethical consumption, conscious consumption, like wanting to, to buy from brands that are all right. And so um, kind of expecting to see lots and lots and lots of information or, or lots of boxes checked. But I think consumers are catching up too. And they know that it's not possible. If you're, if you're doing things right, like there's always going to be more to do. Uh, so just be candid and explain like, this is how far we've gotten. We know we're not perfect. This is what we're planning to do. Um, and, and let's see where we can go from there. So when companies are setting impact goals and making statements about the changes they're going to make, what are your, some of your tips and tricks for, to get the communications right? Because like we talked about just before, what point do they start taking their customers on this journey with them? Yeah. So I think when it comes to communicating goals, like the first bit is like actually setting the goals and set realistic goals. I think that's the thing is like, there's a lot of pressure these days to set really ambitious targets and to maybe even set a goal before you even know how you're going to accomplish it. So I think the first thing is, is like, actually, like focus on communicating your baseline, like, where are we, you can go into detail there first, like, that's the first step. It's okay to spend a lot of time just saying, this is where we are, this is the work that we've already done, to, to even figure out this baseline information. I think, you know, it, it takes a lot of work to even, you know, find out like what your initial carbon footprint is or track down your suppliers and actually know who your secondary tertiary suppliers are. So don't kind of stumble over that and act as if like it wasn't a big deal. Like it's okay to spend the time being like, we've actually just spent a lot of time figuring out where we are and what our initial impact is. Then when it comes to setting targets, make them realistic um, and make sure you have a plan for actually uh, figuring out like how to meet them. So don't just set like, a net zero target if you have no way um, of knowing how you're going to reduce your carbon emissions or if you if you, if you think you're just going to buy offsets to, to, to offset them. Uh, and then in terms of communicating them, just again, be, be specific. So don't just say like, we're going to have a zero impact by 2030 or by 2025 or whatever it is. Say like, this is, you know, it, like be human about it it's okay to you know these, these are not these are not small things they're exciting and I think there's a lot of pressure sometimes to try and make what you're doing seem like you're the first person doing something or you're doing the most of something um, and that's it's just unrealistic especially if you're a smaller business especially if you're an independent brand just explain kind of simply the changes that you're making whether it's you know we are going to make our packaging slightly smaller so that we're reducing like our shipping footprint overall or we're going to be making switches to some of our key materials um, it's okay to 
to kind of be open, transparent and human about your progress here. You don't have to speak, uh, I don't know, like some like really ambitious rule book with, with a lot of crazy goals in there. <laughs> Yeah, can you run into any problems being too transparent in this process? Definitely. Look, I, I don't know about... I think you can run into problems... I, I personally think there's like no, no no such thing as too transparent, right? Like transparency will always be rewarded. I think the tricky thing is, is when you pretend you're being more transparent than you actually are. So, you know, don't, don't make claims which you're not actually sure about, which is why... I think a lot of the initial work that businesses need to do is less about figuring out how to make um, a better impact or make less of a negative impact and more about what is our actual impact. It, it, even when you're running a business, it is really tricky to know what goes into your product, like what is actually like the impact of everything that you use. So spend that time figuring that out because you can't be transparent about things that you don't know. So uh, it, it will probably, you know, I, I'd say like there's, there's probably no such thing as too transparent because uh by the time you you find all of that information out you're going to want to do something about it and i do think that consumers um will appreciate all of that yeah that's great advice and you've also done a great story on conscious consumption on medium which i will link in the show notes but another mic drop moment for me from that piece is you wrote that there is very rarely a choice that will benefit the producer consumer and the environment equally so is a fully holistic approach possible or if not, how can brands get as close to it as possible? Yeah, look, I think, you know, it, it all comes back to the same point, which is like, there is no such thing as perfect. Like there's not a perfect business when it comes to sustainability. And there's also not a perfect choice. A lot of choices when it comes to impact do have trade-offs. You know, you, you probably see this with, with packaging a lot. Sometimes it might make sense to use a technically more, you know, environmentally, um, like harmful material because of the performance qualities that has ha it has and like how well it will protect your product or how well uh, how long it will make your product last like there that it, it it's about yeah that so there's basically trade-offs associated with a lot of decisions and I think it's about understanding those trade-offs and knowing that you've made that just decision consciously or intentionally right so you just need to be able to explain like this is the choice that we've made because like there aren't perfect there's no kind of silver bullet solution that's going to check every box um in terms of kind of brands being holistic, I do think a holistic approach is is um, is, is possible because that's just about making sure that you're considering the impacts on all of these stakeholder groups. So while you may not be able to like pick a solution that works perfectly for everyone, at least you will have been able to consider all those options and you're making sure that you're not, you know, you haven't just like totally ignored your impact on animals or totally ignored the impact on your workers and your supply chain. It's important to make sure that you've actually like looked into it you understand what the impact is and you understand the trade-offs that you're making because trade-offs are being made um any any brand that thinks like we found the perfect material it's it's absolutely wonderful there's nothing wrong with it um sorry i just i feel like a, i'm a lot of my work is just like bursting bubbles which is really sad people come into <laughs> the space and they're really excited to like just do everything right and i'm like sorry it's it's not possible you're not going to get everything perfect but um ultimately like i do think that that approach is is what makes um sustainability more accessible because uh, it, it's just like any other function in a company, right? Like you have to make decisions. Uh, sometimes those decisions, like you're, you're stuck between two that, that aren't great, but um, one will make slightly more sense for your business. And as long as you know why you've taken that choice, uh, you said. I'm sure most people listening to this business owner or not want to consume more consciously in everyday life. So how do we differentiate good businesses from good marketing and be more savvy as shoppers? Yeah, I think, look, it's, re it's really tricky. Um, I'm also super susceptible to like great marketing. I would say try and focus, you know, and this is true of any claims, not just sustainability claims, try and focus on the content of the claims and less the way that they're communicated, right? So it's not, oh, this is a super jazzy, wonderful kind of like interactive microsite or like what a great marketing email that's come in with this information um, and look for specificity. Can a brand answer questions? Is it, is it providing enough detailed information? I think like if they're just saying, look, like we pay our workers fair wages, is there any more information that, that backs that up? Look for evidence basically of any claim being made. Uh, you can't, you know, it, like I said, it, it's tricky on the business side to be fully transparent, to understand every element of 
um, your supply chain, kind of every impact that your business has. So also like, like be generous with, with businesses. It's not about like if someone can't provide this information, that means they're totally terrible. But um, to kind of separate like the greenwashing from from like the, the people that are making a really meaningful impact, I think it's just about looking for very specific information. Don't look for uh, one that I see often is just like, look, like we use sustainable materials. That's not good enough. I want to know what the actual material is. So just go one level beyond the claim. If any brand is saying they're ethical, you need to, you need to understand like what, what makes them ethical. And if they're just using those big, broad statements without any um, precision underneath for, for why they're able to make that claim, then, then that's an issue. Yeah. What are some examples of brands that have raised the bar for what sustainability in business can look like? Some yeah, best well, case examples. You know, everyone will have slightly different, you know, best case examples, because again, there's not like an objective truth or, or a perfect business. For me, I, I'm really, um, I think the idea of holistic impact is important. And so considering your impact across all bases, one um, business that I really like in this regard is Sweetgreen, the American salad chain. So they're, they're a business that has thought really carefully about their impacts across the board. You know, like they think about it when it comes to sourcing the ingredients that they use in their salad. They think about it when it comes to the actual uh, stores, like the materials they build in their stores, the packaging that they use for their products, uh, the way that they compensate, promote and hire like the teams that work in their stores. They also make like local community impacts through school, um, like working with schools and kind of within food deserts. So they're, they're an example of a brand that um, I, I actually don't even like salad. I'm, I'm more of like a pizza, <laughs> pizza ice cream person. But I do I do really like to <laughs> green as a brand just because of how um, thoughtful they've been ab about thinking about their impact across the board um another one that, that people might be familiar with is girlfriend collective so they're one of my favorite fashion brands like they they're an active wear brand i actually don't even work out that much i don't know why all of my examples for for great businesses are ones where i don't even really <laughs> love the product but i will buy girlfriend collective Active. you're probably wear. like if even i'm sold yeah <laughs> <laughs> then they um, must be doing something right <laughs> if even they're roping me in <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're, they're an example of a business that started off really small and, and has seen some great success, partly because of their impact. But, you know, there are plenty of brands that use recycled um, nylon for their products. So Girlfriend Collective or, or Recycled Polyester, Girlfriend Collective is not um, the only one that's doing that. But they were one of the first to make their entire product line full of recycled materials. They think also about like the, the kind of like the factories that they work with. They um, have also been really inclusive and representative in the marketing, like the, the people that they show their product on, the variety of people that they sell to, the colors that they use, the sizes that they offer. Um, and like they're, they're working on consumer education. So they, they know that there are issues with their product. It's not perfect. They know that even though they're using recycled materials, ultimately, like the pro their products when washed will re release microplastics. So they don't shy away from that. They're not saying like, look, our product's perfect. They're like, even though... We're doing something right. We know that there's still issues with the way that um, these products might be used. So they, you know, they sell washing machine filters and kind of other other products to help you mitigate those impacts as a consumer. So I think that's a great example of, of a brand that um, is a, is a smaller business, uh, although it's grown a bit now, uh, and has been thinking holistically about their impact and also owns up the kind of shortcomings of their product and acknowledges a, a trade off. So for those who haven't invested in sustainability or social impact yet, why do it now? What will it mean for the future success of their brand? Yeah, you know, this is a fair question to ask, but I don't even know that it needs to be answered anymore because I think it's really clear, right? Like any any business knows these days that like the, the people, like people in general, we care about climate change. We do care about like our impacts on other people and the people who are starting businesses know that, you know it as a consumer and you know that you have like a higher bar for what you expect of companies. And even if you don't, if you're one of those few people that really doesn't care and you're just in it for profit, you will recognize that like consumers are expecting more of you. So it's it's not even, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a, a super progressive or exciting thing to do anymore. It's becoming a bit more of a table stakes activity. Um, and, and while that's sad because there's fewer opportunities for, you know, a brand to differentiate itself based on impact, um, I think it's, it's great for people that work in the space that have wanted to see the bar pushed forward where, you know, doing good and, and being conscious and, and kind of um, aware of your impact in the world and looking to, to do better is, 
is kind of just seen as like something that's totally necessary the same way that like having a social media account and like investing in your brand um brand is sorry if that was a cop-out answer Mm. yeah (laughs) but it's obvious no that was a great (laughs) answer and I think also another point is it does make your business more resilient to the changes the world is facing right going forward so like it just makes total sense as well to yeah I mean your business to future proof it as well it is absolutely necessary to future proof it I don't want to sugarcoat it just because it's just because it's becoming increasingly common doesn't yet mean it's easy right like more sustainable materials, more ethical practices, like those things can cost more money, they can cost more time, they can cost more energy, but they are they are becoming the norm. And so if you do not think about those things now, you will be forced to think about them in a few years time, you might as well like be ahead of the game, or be kind of at the center of the pack rather than like playing catch up later on. Totally. And we've been discussing a lot of um, in-depth topics. Where can people go to educate themselves further on the stuff we're talking about? Where would you recommend? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I really like, I like this. If, in terms of deeper education, I think it can be really tricky. There's a lot of great information online, but it can be tough to, tough to wade through. Um, I think with sustainability and social impact, things are changing all the time. So I don't recommend necessarily like a textbook or a book. I think sites like Fast Company that don't just focus on sustainable news, you know, it's not just about like ethical businesses or anything like that. They're just an innovation site. They're constantly showcasing, you know, what companies are doing around, uh, yeah around these topics and that's a great place to get inspiration although you do sometimes need to read through and just make sure like is this great marketing or is it greenwashing but it's it's an inspiring place to be um i think this podcast is going to be a great resource i know you're speaking (laughs) to a a wide variety of people that work in sustainability in, in different fields and i think um just the the community that no issue for example is building between like between the people that you supply and and kind of like like that international network of people around the world um you you will be you, you will uh, have a great kind of network of people just because all of the businesses that you work will, will have decided to invest in, in more sustainable packaging. Yeah, and that's why we wanted to kind of drill down on these topics as well, because we as a business use the term sustainability all the time. So yeah, talking to different businesses, different experts about what they actually think it means and how brands can apply it is really important for us as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, you know, look, language we use constantly changes. And I think it made sense to use the word sustainable or sustainability as a differentiator for a really long time because most businesses weren't thinking about these kinds of things. But now a lot of businesses are. So we need to just get a bit more precise and specific about the the language that we're using. But it's it's an exciting time to be thinking about the impact of your business just because there's so much information out there. And um, it's also, I'd say, like, compared to most functions or areas of business, it's a collaborative space to be in. If you are wondering, you know, like, oh, your competitor has like a really sustainable packaging option that you might don't have, or maybe works with the supplier, you might be surprised. Like people might be willing to share this information because people who've thought consciously about their impact, like they they want other people to level up as well. So um, it's not, it's not like, a, It's not like marketing or advertising where everyone's really protective of their campaign ideas. I found personally that people are willing to to really share in this space um, and to educate and to inform. So if, um, you know, if you're, I I recommend like if you have a business and you've seen uh, another business in your industry that's slightly more impactful, like you could reach out and ask them, you know, I'm not saying they definitely will tell you what they're doing, but that they might be willing to help because, um, we're ultimately like we're we're all in this together this being the state of the world yeah I'm just thinking of an example off the top of my head I think was it all birds that created some sort of new material and just opened it up for use for everyone they even wanted some of the bigger footwear brands like um Adidas to to take it and use it for all of their yeah, I mean, it's going forward as well. So there was n- that, that protective mindset was not there. They were like, it's a free for all. We just want to get this out and create change. 
That's um, th- yeah, that's that's a recent example. But to be honest, in social impact and and sustainability, this has been happening for a while. Like a lot of the big industry initiatives that you see started off as a single corporate initiative. Like maybe they developed a toolkit or a set of standards and then rolled it out and decided like we need other people to be involved. Um, you know, a great like two competitors. They're um, they're two kind of leather footwear handbag brands based in the US, one is called Able and the other one is called Nisolo. They partnered together, even though they're competitors, like serving a pretty similar market um, to, to kind of start sharing their lowest wage, like a campaign for sharing their lowest wage. So there's a lot of examples of open sourcing initiatives, frameworks and collaboration between competitors when it comes to this kind of thing. Yeah, that's really inspiring to see actually. Yeah. And my final question for you is how do you measure and define the impact of your work? So what does success look like to you? Ooh, that's that's a really, really good question. Um, I think it's not quantitative <laughs> at all, right? Like I've, I've advocated for maybe like a human, a more human way of thinking about your, your impact of your business. And I think it's the same for the impact of my work. Like if I can help any business or any entrepreneur like feel more confident in their ability to, to think carefully about their impacts and to do something slightly better, like that works for me. If people are learning new things after engaging with me and, and even better, if they're able to make changes to their business, um, that, that's an exciting thing. And I don't, you know, I, I love working with all brands. And of course, it's really exciting to work for a super mission driven brand that knows already um, what to do and how to do it. But I think I get a lot, a lot of, um, yeah, uh, where I feel the most impact are from businesses that feel like they can't do sustainability. They're intimidated by it. They have no idea where to begin. And if I can kind of get them on their way and help them kind of go down a route where they feel like they know it's a journey and they're on their way, um, that's that's always going to feel really good. Yeah, that must make it all worthwhile. <laughs> all the <laughs> hard work it took to get them there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've reached the end of my questions, but it was so yeah. great to talk to you and very insightful, I'm sure. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you for having me.